Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome all of you, those online and here in person, to today's presentation on immunotherapy for brain tumors. Today, we hear from Dr. Michael Lim, a professor of neurosurgery and the director of brain tumor immunotherapy at Johns Hopkins University. A quick note for those on the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question of Dr. Lim, please submit it via the chat function. We will collect these questions until the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. And now, Dr. Lim, the floor is yours. Thank you for that kind of invitation. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and for tuning in. It's really an honor and privilege for me to be here. <clears throat> I am a, a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins. I have a particular interest in brain tumors, but I also have a, um, a pretty big interest in uh, immunotherapies and novel therapies for brain cancer, which is why we're here today. Um, as we go through the talk, I think you'll, under, um, you'll see where some of our interests overlap, uh, particularly with combination therapies and uh, ablative therapies, and where I think that could fit in with immunotherapies today. So um, today, the main part of my talk is to kind of give you some insights into where we are and how much more we need to do uh, in order to be able to get immunotherapy uh, to work for glioblastomas. Uh, these are my relevant disclosures, okay? So I think many of us recognize in this room today that immunotherapy has really been a revolution uh, for cancer therapy. Um, I think that if we've looked, particularly since 2014, and maybe in, in the past uh, two years, there's been a rapid number of uh, FDA approvals or for different cancer types with different immunotherapies. And I think what's really remarkable is the fact that um, uh, this is just uh, working in a lot of different cancers and we've seen people's lives that have been changed even with advanced cancers, okay? And the majority of these immunotherapies are based on a class of drugs called checkpoint molecules, okay? So a checkpoint molecule, just to give you some background, is the second signal that occurs after a T cell binds to its cognate antigen that's expressed on the MHC molecule. And the second signal, which is denoted as two on these figures, either turns the T cells on or turns the T cells off, right? And the second signal for turning the T cells are very important for us in the sense that it prevents things like autoimmune disorders. And cancers have learned to usurp that and hide from the immune system, okay? And it turns out that if you disrupt this interaction, you can actually get a very vigorous anti-tumor immune response, okay? And as a result, I think many of you have seen these commercials online, I mean, uh, online or on TV, and um, you know, they're projecting this uh, industry to be you know, close to $30 billion uh, in the next few years, okay? And so what's really remarkable about these, uh, this immunotherapy is that not only are small tumors responding, but big tumors, okay? If you look, these are figures from the uh, New England Journal paper that Suzanne Tapalian published um, at Hopkins. And these are examples of patients that have, you know, for example, renal cell carcinomas or melanomas. These tumors are big, okay? If you've ever looked at a cancer cell under the microscope and compared it to the size of a, a, a lymphocyte under the microscope, cancer cells are about 50 to 100 times larger in terms of volume to, uh, in comparison to a lymphocyte. So if you imagine how many uh, lymphocytes are gonna be needed to kill cancer, this is quite remarkable, right? And one of the things that this figure doesn't show you as these things uh, melt away is that, you know, oftentimes you need six months or longer uh, to get a, an effective immune response, right? So this suggests that maybe some of these tumors that grow really fast, the immune system just not gonna have enough time to be able to chip away and get at cancer, right? So um, this is a figure that was given to me by BMS, but you can see all these different uh, indications that have been approved for, for different cancers, okay? And you can see from uh, essentially 2017 on, there's been a huge number of, of uh, FDA approvals. But if we can summarize where we are today with the immunotherapy for cancer, there are three facts, right? First, in the cancers that are responding, it's not 90% of cancers that are responding, only about 20 to 30% of the cancers are responding, right? That's in lung cancer, melanoma, kidney cancer, head and neck cancers. Furthermore, 
these therapies are not benign, right? We always think chemotherapy is the worst. We see people with losing their hair, throwing up, and, and uh, very fatigued. But these immunotherapies are not without toxicities too. In fact, um, people can develop bad autoimmune disorders. Colitis and pneumonitis are, are some of the most deadly ones that people can develop. And it can put people in the hospital. And uh, some people actually have died from these drugs, right? And so when we take care of patients with cancer, we're not only focusing, on, obviously, on trying to make them live longer, but we want to make their quality of life good. And so if we give them a therapy and it doesn't confer them benefit, yet we're giving them all these bad things, we've actually done a disservice for our patients. Lastly, we've also found out that while these responses have been incredible, in about 25% of the patients, their tumors come back. So they have actually, the tumors have figured out ways to evolve and hide from the immune system or uh, develop resistance to these checkpoint inhibitors. So we have a lot of room to go and a lot of place uh, and a lot of um, ways. I mean, it, it's very important that we increase our response rate and decrease the toxicities for our patients. Okay. So what about checkpoint inhibitors for gliomas? So when we started seeing these great responses in melanoma, lung cancer, and renal cell carcinomas, of course, in the glioma world, we've also been very excited. So this is a study that was published by Peter Fetchy, um, one of the first studies with checkpoint inhibitors. He used something called an SMA560 model. But CTLA-4, when you block anti-CTLA-4, uh, conferred survival benefit in, in these mice, OK? Um, for PD-1, uh, Jing Zheng in my lab also looked at this and, and saw that there was improved survival. Now, the PD-1 story was interesting because uh, up here on the top left is a picture of a, um, uh, a patient that I saw in my clinic. Uh, this was from a CCR paper. And um, at that time, this patient came to my clinic and he had a, a brain met. I thought it was a typical brain met patient. I saw him and he was on a clinical trial and I, you know, I said, fine, you're on a clinical trial. I, the standard of care for a patient with a solitary brain med is to take him to surgery if it's in a um, non-eloquent area. And so I took him to surgery and to my surprise, pathology showed only inflammatory cells, no active tumor cells, okay? And, and so I remember being uh, very interested in this patient and I followed him and he had widely metastatic disease and all his tumors melted away. Uh, he got a complete response. And, and so I remember being very impressed with this particular patient. And I found out that this person was on a drug called MDX-110, which later turned out to be um, from a company called Metarex that was acquired by BMS and that's anti-PD-1. And that's actually what sparked our interest in looking at anti-PD-1 at the time. And so this is kind of the uh, nice part of being both in the clinical and in the research world. So anyways, Jing Zhang, who is now a radiation oncologist at uh, University of Washington, saw that um, there was actually improved survival in mice that were treated with anti-PD-1, and it actually worked better when combined with radiation, and I'll talk about that in a second. Also, it turns out that um, the, the ligand for PD-1, which is called PD-L1, is actually expressed in glioblastoma. So, you know, when you get a higher grade tumor, there's higher levels of this PD-L1. So we had preclinical data that suggested that these checkpoint molecules are gonna work, and we actually saw the target for these checkpoint molecules. So we thought that this should work in glioblastoma. And actually, there were some initial case studies that showed that patients were responding. If you can see, this is a case report from Toronto of twins. Um, this particular child had glioblastoma and it melted away with PD-1, okay? So there's a lot of excitement. We thought that this was gonna work in glioblastoma and Bristol-Myers Squibb launched a large phase three trial for recurrent glioblastoma patients. And Unfortunately, the trial came out negative. The control arm was Avastin or bevacizumab. And both overall survival and progression-free survival were negative, okay? While that study was going, BMS had also launched a, a study on the newly diagnosed glioblastomas. And this was a Checkmate 498 study, which was in unmethylated MGMT patients, okay? And uh, it was a large phase three clinical trial. And unfortunately, that trial was negative when they looked at their primary endpoint of overall survival. They also have a large phase three trial going on in MGMT methylated glioblastoma, and that trial is still going. Now, in that uh, trial, they put as their primary endpoints PFS and overall survival. And so they had to report the PFS, which was negative, 
And a lot of people are saying this trial was negative, but we have to, but it's a very important nuance. This trial is not negative. Um, with PFS, is progression-free survival, that's kind of a messy endpoint with immunotherapy. Uh, we don't use, I, I usually don't look at that as much as overall survival. So the methylated study is still underway, okay? But, you know, it's interesting, not all brain tumors are failing, right? And so this was a, a, a New England Journal paper that was published uh, about a year ago now. And uh, what they did was they gave uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 to patients with brain metastasis, okay? And what they found was that they had actually about 60, over 65% of the patients actually responded to these checkpoint inhibitors, okay? Now, the nuance to the study was that they were uh, asymptomatic brain meds. If they were symptomatic, they were not put onto this trial. But 67% of the patients actually had a response. But the other eye-popping number from this was 55%, or a little bit more than 55% of the patients developed grade three, four toxicities. In other words, they were, most of those were hospitalized patients. Okay? They, they developed colitis and pneumonitis. So you know, while this was impressive, remember, these immunotherapies are not benign. And you know, one of the things that people have commented on in commentaries is, for example, stereotactic radiosurgery, with the gamma knife, the cyber knife, is 80 to 90% effective, but does not have these grade three, four toxicities. So there's now a debate in the field about what to do for brain metastasis. And um, I think a lot of people are more in favor of, of treating these with radiation rather than checkpoint inhibitors, if that makes sense. But with this data, there is some pessimism for GDM, obviously. And um, it turns out that, I'm sorry, my slides got flipped. It turns out that we are not alone in terms of the uh, fight against uh, these cancers with immunotherapy. There are basically a class, two, two subsets of tumors that we're calling them, hot and cold, okay? If, there's a, if a tumor responds to immunotherapy, like melanoma and lung cancer, we consider them hot. And if there's been negative results like what we've seen in glioblastoma, we've been calling them cold. And interestingly enough, prostate cancer and pancreatic cancers are cold tumors, okay? Now, what I, I tell my students is that if you look at these cancers that are responding, these are all cancers that are arising in organs that have contact with either toxins or the outside world, right? Skin, UV light, just bad air, whatever it is. Lung, right? You get exposed to smoke toxins in the air, kidneys, right? They filter out all the toxins. These are all organs that seem to have to have some sort of ability to uh, have the immune system kind of at its, at its tip. Whereas the pancreas, the prostate, and GBM are very nestled in the, in the body. They really don't have that toxicity. So, you know, it suggests that maybe there's just something different with them, okay? So what are our next steps for glioblastoma? What are, or what are we doing now with this negative data, right? We think that immunotherapy can be effective because as I pointed out, while the results were negative, we were seeing patients who responded to immunotherapy in our trials. So, you know, people are looking at two main, if you were to ask me right now, there are two main buckets that they're doing, what we call combination approaches and modulating the myeloid compartment. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So what is it that makes tumors resistant, okay? And one of the things that we've been doing is, uh, this is a review paper that we wrote, wrote. It's not simply enough to just say a tumor is resistant to the immune system, right? The tumors actually probably have two main areas of resistance, and we call it adaptive resistance, which is on the y-axis, and intrinsic resistance, which is on the x-axis, okay? And so it turns out that, for example, melanomas have low adaptive and low intrinsic resistance, right? So that's why it seems like a lot of different immunotherapies work and a lot of vaccines have worked for melanomas, okay? Whereas non-small cell lung cancer has low intrinsic resistance. And intrinsic resistance, I, think, I tend to think of like, for example, if they have checkpoint molecules that are expressed. They're just, from the beginning, they have some resistance to the immune system. Non-small cell lung cancer has low intrinsic resistance, which is why these checkpoint molecules are working very well. But they have high adaptive resistance, which means they have, a, over time, a lot of lung cancers do develop resistance to immunotherapy, okay? Prostate cancer, on the other hand, has high intrinsic resistance, um, but low adaptive resistance. So while checkpoint molecules aren't working, if you guys remember the first immuno, one of the first immunotherapies that were approved was something called the Dendrion vaccine, 
um, and that's a dendritic cell vaccine, which works by counteracting adaptive resistance, okay? And unfortunately, glioblastomas are high in both. So we probably need to come up with strategies that attack both the adaptive and intrinsic resistance of glioblastomas to come up with some therapies. So what are some combination approaches that we're doing uh, kind of in a rational approach, right? So we have what we call combination IO therapy. Another is called kindling approach. Another is called vaccines and CAR T cells. I won't really talk about those much today. And then we'll talk about targeting the myeloid compartment, okay? So as I mentioned before, the immune system is actually exquisitely complex. It's, it's not just um, lymphocytes and um, dendritic cells, right? So it turns out that with all these different immune cells, there's a very complex interplay between these cells to communicate, right? We need to be able to, for example, if you get a cut in your arm, you don't need to incite inflammation throughout your entire body. You need to incite inflammation right in your arm, right? And other times, if you get a really bad infection, you may need to uh, get a really uh, vigorous immune response. But if you get a mild cold, you don't need to have such a vigorous immune response, right? Which is why the flu versus um, a cold have very different ways you feel from your body. And so it turns out that there are a lot of different checkpoint molecules, and they probably have a hierarchy which we don't understand. And that allows us to have a, you know, a volume switch and a location switch for our different immune systems, right? So one of the things that we've been looking at is we've checked out other uh, checkpoint molecules. So we were lucky enough to be early on in this. And so this is an example of a patient that I, we took from the OR and we went back and we started checking for other checkpoint molecules. And so in this patient, we found something called anti-lag-3. And um, we also found a different checkpoint molecule called anti-TIM3. So we started looking at these other checkpoint molecules early on. So lag-3, is one that I want to talk about for a second. LAG3 is another checkpoint molecule, much like PD-1, but it turns out that LAG3 was really well described in viral infections. It turns out viruses are also good at suppressing an immune response to hide from the, um, you know, the lymphocytes. And what LAG3 does is it binds to MHC class 2, but basically it's expressed on T cells and it's expressed on lymph uh, dendritic cells, um, which are antigen-presenting cells. And so what we did was we saw that it was positive in flow cytometry. So um, Sarah Harris Bookman and Demetrius, uh, who were, you know, a, was a technician and a postdoc in my lab, started looking at patient samples. This is an example of a patient with a, these are four different GBM patients, but we started seeing that these uh, lag three cell populations were present. And then we went to the animal models. And basically, if you look at this bar graph here on the right, if you look at the first column, if a cell was positive for PD-1 and LAG3 expression, it was low in expressing interferon gamma. Now, interferon gamma is basically a, a marker of activation status of T cells. So if you have low interferon gamma, it means these T cells are essentially shut off, okay? But if you did not express PD-1 or LAG3, which is over here on the right, you were expressing interferon gamma. It meant those T cells were on. So it was kind of a marker telling us that LAG3 and PD-1 were potentially great markers to go after. So what we did was when you gave uh, LAG3 and PD-1, which is this purple line here, we got very nice improvement in survival in animals that, were, that had glioblastoma. We also had a knockout LAG3 mouse, and when we gave PD-1, we got this really great response here, okay? Hold that thought for a second. We also then worked on a different checkpoint molecule called CD137. Now CD137 is an on switch. It's a little bit different in, the, in comparison to PD-1. If you activate that receptor, it turns the T cells on. So it's like an accelerator for a T cell. Okay, so there are different checkpoint molecules. And we were very interested in CD137. Zineb Belkade, who was a, a medical student and postdoc with me, uh, started looking at um, uh, activating CD137, okay? And it turns out that you could improve survival in mice once you activated the CD137. And on this curve, you can see this second line here, um, which is just about under 20%, uh, worked very well when you gave CTLA-4 and uh, CD137. Um, and if you combine it with radiation, we got even better effects. But um, the whole point was the CD137 also seemed to be a good molecule. So what we did was we went to the NCI and we got um, a drug from BMS, both the LAG3 and um, 41BB and um, 
basically went to the NCI and was able to get funding for a, a large multi-center phase one clinical trial. And basically what we did was we created four arms, LAG3 alone, CD137, gave LAG3 plus PD1 and CD137 plus PD1 in patients with recurrent glioblastoma, first time recurrent. And you know, because it's a phase one, we wanted to first make sure that it was safe for our patients. And the toxicities were actually quite low for our patients. And that wasn't as much of an issue. But what was really interesting was with the CD137 alone, we got a median overall survival of 14 months, 13.9 and 13 .9 up here. With the LAG3 and LAG3 plus PD1, we didn't see much improvement in terms of um, median overall survival. But what's interesting is if you look at the LAG3 plus PD1, which is this dotted line here, we started seeing patients that uh, had this tail, very much like the other immunotherapies. And um, in fact, in two out of three patients, we actually had this very impressive um, pseudo progression, and then the tumors essentially just petered out. And so, you know, we have long term survivors from this, uh, which we're very excited about. We're able to actually, um, before I go to that, I'll finish this thought. What was interesting is when we started looking at the patients that responded, we did see as a biomarker, this is multiplex IHC, we did see an increased number of inflammatory cells in these glioblastomas compared to the ones that were not responding. And in the responders, we actually saw what they call T-cell clonality. So it turns out that if the T-cells um, that have some specificity to the tumor increased, um, they were more likely to be a responder. And so with this, you know, we had positive radiographic response, positive overall survival. We've been able to um, get support and we're likely moving to the Alliance to do a large phase two slash three trial with this, okay? So again, this was an example of us going back, finding a new target relevant for GBMs and we, we found something interesting. Now, on the other hand, one of the other approaches that we've been very interested in is what I call the kindling, okay? And so, I think everybody understands this concept, right? If you can create a small area of, of um, uh, kindling, you can get a large fire. Um, and so many of us have been thinking about uh, trying to create kindling for some of these cold tumors, okay? If we think about where we are today with patients getting, uh, for patients with glioblastoma, they're getting a very immunosuppressive care. They're getting radiation, temozolomine steroids, all of which create immunosuppression. I tell the, the analogy I tell people is, it's like giving a diabetic insulin, but then feeding them 12, clan, uh, 12 cans of Coke, and then saying, why isn't your sugar low, right? In this case, we wipe out the immune system, and then we give them immunotherapy. You know, intuitively, it doesn't seem like it would work well. So the first thing that we thought about was radiation, right? Currently, patients get hyperfractionated radiation to 60 grays over six weeks. And Skip Grossman at Hopkins had a very nice paper that showed that when the CD4 counts drop with this radiation, if they dropped you know, very quickly, it was actually a poor prognostic sign. Turns out that hyperfractionated radiation can wipe out the immune system. So what they did also is they took pancreatic patients because one of the criticisms of this study was that these patients were getting temozolomide, which is radi uh, chemotherapy, which is lymphodepleting. They took patients with pancreatic cancer and gave one set of patients stereotactic and another set of patients just the conventional. And they showed that when you got uh, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, which is in blue, you had only a less than 20% chance of developing lymphopenia. Whereas if you got conventional radiation, you got you know, almost a 75% chance of getting lymphopenia, right? And so again, this was, again, taking observations from the clinic. This is, for example, this is an example of a patient that came into my, um, came into the emergency room actually with a newly diagnosed tumor. And so um, we treated this tumor with stereotactic radiosurgery. And what happened to this patient uh, was that this patient started to develop edema around this lesion. You guys see all this white around it? And so I just remember being very impressed by it because the patient had to be treated with steroids. And so, that to me so that perhaps maybe immune, uh, radiation in a focused manner could actually create inflammation. And if you look throughout the literature, there's actually documentation showing that stereotactic radiation can induce inflammation. It can cause not only through cell death to cause antigen expression, but it can actually upregulate MHC molecules and release cytokines. 
Chris Jackson, who was in my lab, actually showed that when you give focus radiation, these T cells come in and these T cells are secreting lots of different cytokines that are supposed to be rich in maybe even killing cancer. So uh, as I mentioned before with the first paper, Jing Zhang um, had this idea that perhaps if we give uh, a glioblastoma, um, treat it with anti-PD-1 and this focus radiation, we could perhaps disrupt the immune microenvironment of the tumors get it to spill antigens, and the uh, anti-PD-1 would then activate the T cells to kind of maintain an immune response. And this is the, um, the stereotactic radio surgery device that we have at Hopkins. It's called the SARP, Small Animal Radiating Platform. And uh, what we can do is we have one millimeter collimators all the way up to um, four millimeter collimators, but you can deliver stereotactic radio surgery to these animals. And so when we did that, we actually got a very nice um, synergistic response, okay? Furthermore, if you took those mice that were essentially cured and re-challenged them with my, uh, tumors, even in the flank, which was distant from where the brain was, they essentially remained immunized against the tumors. And it turns out that when you gave this combination, you actually had an increased number of immune cells that came into the brain that were activated and a decrease in what they call Tregs. These are T cells that essentially suppress an immune response, okay? And as I mentioned before, when we did this with CD137, again, we saw this trend of improved survival. And so over a, you know, a series of years, we've been testing different immunotherapy agents, anti-gitter, which turns off Tregs. Again, was uh, we had an improvement in survival with SRS. And so um, these therapies have essentially um, resulted, we think, in an augmented approach. So it's kind of this kindling. Sorry why these slides were uh, duplicated. So one of the things that we did was we said, all right, well, maybe in glioblastoma, this approach could work. But we also were cognizant that PD-1 wasn't working at this time. So one of the other papers that we, were, uh, we had caught our eyes was uh, a paper by Dr. Hammerman's group, where they started looking at, this is a busy slide, so I'm going to just summarize. They started looking at um, tumors that develop resistance to PD-1. And they said, well, what are other mechanisms of immunosuppression? And one of the things that they found from that was TIM3, okay? And TIM3 is also another molecule that's relevant for glioblastoma. And so Jennifer Kim, when she was in my lab, showed that as the tumors, over time in these tumors, these tumors started developing these TIM3 PD-1 positive cells, okay? Not only in CD4s, but they developed in CD8 cells also. And so it turns out TIM3 is another molecule that's a checkpoint molecule expressed on lymphocytes as well as dendritic cells. And TIM3 is another molecule that's um, activated by, um, or be, uh, that is uh, used for viruses to escape the immune system. And again, it turns off the immune response. And it turns out that again, in a certain subset of GBM patients, there are um, TIM3 positive T cells. And so uh, we had this idea again, that if we combine radiation with a combination checkpoint inhibitors, we could get improvement in survival. And so, if you look here at the top red line, we're, when we gave TIM3 plus PD-1 plus SRS, we had 100% um, improvement in survival. TIM3 plus PD-1 also had a very nice synergistic response. But with this, um, we, we did this three times and we got a very uh, nice synergistic response with this. And so as a result of this, we actually now have a trial open at Hopkins where we're giving TIM3 plus PD-1 plus stereotactic rate of surgery uh, for patients with recurrent GBM. And we're trying to go to, again, going from the clinics back, uh, back to the lab, back to the clinic with a newly designed trial, okay? Another thing that we've also been working on, again, going back to the theme of all these therapies that we give to our patients are immunosuppressive. We started talking about chemotherapy and we started to ask this question about what is chemotherapy doing to our patients, right? So we know that chemo, the, the temozolomide that we give to our patients is incredibly lymphodepleting. Patients' white blood cell counts drop dramatically. So Demetrius and Jennifer Kim asked an interesting question. They said, what if we change the way we deliver chemo? If we give it locally, maybe we can get a very nice synergistic immune response, maintain the health of the immune system, and maybe we'll actually see something happen with immunotherapy. And uh, whereas with systemic chemotherapy, we're just killing everything and maybe we, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. So this was the idea. If we give chemotherapy plus anti-PD-1, perhaps we could get a very nice um, 
uh, again, kindling to start a systemic immune response. So gliadel wafers is what Dr. Brem, my chairman, developed and is FDA approved. So what we did was gliadel wafers contain a chemotherapy agent called BCNU. And so when we gave BCNU, this is the green line up here, with anti-PD-1, we got a very nice synergistic response, okay? We saw no improvement uh, in, with uh, systemic chemo and anti-PD-1. And then of course, with the, each of the local and systemic chemo, we got some improvement in survival, okay? Now, what we did was at this point here, with these survive, surviving animals, we re-challenged the animals with their tumors, okay? Essentially simulated patients getting recurrent cancer. And interestingly enough, if you got systemic chemo, you know, they died. But if you gave the animals that got systemic chemo anti-PD-1 again, we couldn't rescue them. In other words, what came out of it is suggested that if you give patients chemotherapy and we let their white blood cell counts drop, and then we let their white blood cell counts recover, we make this assumption that their immune system has recovered, but it has not. It turns out that your immune system is actually missing key components. There's these things called memory T cells, which are very important to fighting off the cancer, and they don't recover. So, you know, we come out, uh, this assumption that we made that we give chemotherapy to our patients, let the um, bone marrow recover, and it's gonna be just as good as that, never having chemotherapy is not true, at least based on our animal models. So, you know, everything we do to our patients may have long lasting consequences, okay? Uh, for our publications, they wanted us to redo this um, for the journal. Uh, so we did it again with temozolomide and a second chemo with a different chemotherapy agent and we got the same results. So, you know, the takeaway point from this was that, you know, if you give patients certain chemotherapies, we may handicap their immune system permanently and it, we may not even give them a fighting chance to fight off the cancer later. So we have to be thoughtful about how we do this. So as a result, we've, um, we're working with a company to do a, a large phase two clinical trial. It's gonna be 190 patients. And we're actually giving uh, one set of patients, it's actually been updated. We're taking actually both methylated and unmethylated. It's a little bit more complex trial design, but basically one set of patients are gonna get local chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And the other set of patients are getting local chemotherapy plus standard of care. Does that make sense to people? But again, we're testing this hypothesis of kindling. Another interesting paper that came out recently was, this was by Tim Clausey, and in that Nature Medicine article, there was another companion article by Nacho Malero. Um, and what they did was they decided to give PD-1 before surgery. And in another set of patients, they gave PD-1 after surgery, okay? They called it neoadjuvant PD-1. And if you gave patients neoadjuvant PD-1, you had an improvement in survival that was statistically significant, okay? And they said that when you gave this in a neoadjuvant fashion, you actually had uh, an inflammatory phenotype in these patients. So this again was this idea that perhaps maybe kindling could uh, be uh, involved. And what they found was again, these T cell clones increased in the patients that had a response compared to the others. So that's another biomarker. But what I think was very interesting is this whole concept of neoadjuvant approaches. And so, what people are trying to do again, for new, just to repeat for neoadjuvant, what they're doing is they're basically giving drug before they get surgery, okay? And this was an interesting study. This is something different. This was in our lung cancer. Um, this was done in lung cancer, but I thought the findings from this was, uh, was something notable. First of all, what they did with these patients is that if you had a lung cancer that was resectable, they waited four weeks to do the surgery. And what they did was that they gave anti-PD-1 right bef uh, at four weeks before surgery. And what they did was when they followed the T cells, they saw that there was a spike in the T cells in your body, just basically revved up all your T cells. After about two weeks, they saw some of those T cell numbers decrease. And during this drop off, they thought that there were two things going on. One, the relevant T cells that were gonna kill the cancer went into the tumors. And the other T cells um, that weren't gonna do anything basically quieted back down, okay? And so um, what they did was when they did this and they gave the patients um, anti-PD-1 before surgery, they had a, I think like a 45% response rate. I, have, I don't know the exact number, but something pretty dramatic. But what they also did was they were able to go and start sequencing out what the T cells were, were um, targeting. 
And it turned out that you didn't need like 10 different T cells to kill a large cancer. They said you needed, for example, in this patient, only three core sets of T cells to kill a cancer. That's pretty interesting, right? Three antigens. And what sometimes um, the T cell recognized, there were two T cells that recognized the same protein, it's just different regions of it, like uh, EGFR. So, you know, there are interesting implications to this because doesn't, it means that you maybe you don't need 10 different T cells, but maybe you only need three or four different T cells to be able to get an effective cancer kill. So obviously this has um, applicability to why we're here today because you know, uh, we think these focal therapies could have uh, an important role in kindling an immune response. And so you know, focus ultrasound and laser ablation, uh, there's a lot of um, interest in trying to combine these two to try to get um, an effective immune response for patients. All right. Now, one thing I wanna mention is that um, Right now, there's also some people who believe that these checkpoint molecules, the ones that I showed you, these targets that we think could have hope, um, are also potentially markers for what they call exhaustion. So it turns out that if you take T cells and you chronically stimulate them, they essentially um, lose their ability to kill cancer cells. And sometimes you can lose it permanently. Okay? And they, this is a phenomenon called exhaustion. And some people um, have shown, and this is Dr. Fetchy's work, which is very nice, they showed that when you start expressing some of these checkpoint molecules in patients, you can't rescue them. And it may be too late when you find out that they're expressing LAG3 and TIM3. I think it's a spectrum, but um, there are potentially some patients that aren't gonna respond. So even if we do like focal therapy, we may not be able to revive these, these T cells. Okay. The other uh, concept I wanted to talk about briefly is what we call um, vaccines, okay? And a lot of people have been very excited about doing vaccines for patients. This was a, a, a recent trial that was published about a year and a half ago. And unfortunately, this came back negative. But there's a protein called EGFRV3 that's expressed on cancer cells. And um, phase one, phase two, and uh, the initial phase one and phase two showed some improved efficacy. And they went to a large phase three clinical trial with this. And unfortunately, the uh, overall survival and pr progression-free survival was negative for this. So what people have been doing is now trying to create a personalized peptide vaccine. Excuse me. This is a paper that was published by Dr. Reardon um, out of Dana-Farber. And what they're doing is they're basically taking tumors out of patients and then they're sequencing the tumors. And then there's a computer that can kind of predict which antigens might be relevant for the immune system. And then they create this cocktail of, of um, vaccines and then they inject them back into the patients, okay? Now, this was a small study. It wasn't really meant to assess survival and they didn't see much of a survival benefit, but they did see in some patients um, the T cells that were relevant for these antigens um, uh, coming up. So it suggests that we can teach the immune system uh, to recognize different cancers. The last component part I wanna talk about is the myeloid compartment, okay? So it turns out we think brain tumors are very different immunologically, all right? This is a picture of a patient who came in with a brain met. This was a melanoma metastasis, as you can see right here and here. And so uh, this patient came in very good functional status. I removed the met, the patient went home within 48 hours, okay? And back in 2007, the, ab the prognosis for this patient was quite poor. Even though they left looking perfect, turns out that if you develop a brain metastasis in melanoma, your survival drops to four to five months, okay? Just the fact that you have a brain met in lung cancer or melanoma drops your prognosis poorly. And so Chris Jackson, who is a uh, student and now uh, who just joined our faculty asked us some really interesting question. Why is it that patients who have brain tumors, why is it that they have a poor prognosis? And we think it's actually immunologically driven, okay? It turns out that we, so our hypothesis is that we think that if you develop a brain met, you actually become globally immunosuppressed, okay? And so what we did was um, he took this an experiment. He basically took melanoma and expresses a, a specific uh, antigen called OVA. It's a chicken peptide, right? It's not expressed in mice anywhere. And it turns out that you, there are genetically bred mice that target this specific OVA. So we have an antigen specific model. And so what he did was he took those tumor cells and implanted into the brain of one set of mice and into the flank of another set of mice, okay? And then what he did was he adoptively transferred those genetically made T cells into the mice and then pulled them out a few days later and started measuring them. 
Now, what he found was that if you had a tumor in the brain, okay, somehow the body was actively deleting those T cells. So the ones that could kill the cancers were, were being deleted. Not only were they being deleted, they could not reproduce, they could not divide, and they didn't express um, right over here, much interferon gamma. In other words, when you had a brain tumor, you were actively killing off the T cells that could help you. And those T cells that were left behind were basically um, left, uh, they could not reproduce or they could not um, turn on. So basically they were useless. Whereas if you had the, the tumor in the flank, those T cells could still kill and still could divide, right? So it turns out that perhaps one of the reasons why people have poor prognosis is the fact that the brain tumor causes a global immunosuppression. There was also another um, paper that was published by Peter Fecci that showed that if you have a brain tumor, not only are those T cells deleted, but they found that those T cells were actually sequestered into the bone marrow. So they're being trafficked away from the brain, okay? And when we did a trial with a, uh, what they call heat shock protein, uh, we had started pulling out what they call macrophages from the bloodstream of the patients. And these macrophages, if you culture them with the T cells, were actually turning the T cells off. So it turns out that if you have a tumor in the brain, you're actually getting global immunosuppression, which is a, you know, it's kind of, it's, you know, a very different paradigm in what we're thinking. Um, it's not just like a tumor in the arm, but if you have a tumor in the brain, your whole immune system is suppressed, which probably explains why people don't do as well when you develop brain metastasis. And this is an important thing to overcome. So our question was, you know, what is causing this global immunosuppression, right? Um, it turns out that we think that a group of cells called myeloid cells, and myeloid cells are a very diverse group of cells, but macrophages, dendritic cells are certainly part of them. And it turned out that when uh, Chris found that there's uh, high levels of the cytokine called TGF beta, and TGF beta, we traced it back with these, this expression to these myeloid cells. And if you block the TGF beta, you were able to reverse some of this immunosuppression in the mice. And so um, I'm gonna just skip this slide because it basically summarized what I was just talking about earlier. It turns out that glioblastomas have lots and lots of myeloid cells and very few T cells. So that may have been that while we were focusing all our efforts on T cells, if there's very few T cells in the tumor, we're probably maybe not targeting the right population. And these uh, myeloid cells are predominantly microglia and macrophages and they're likely immunosuppressive, okay? And so a lot of attention now has been directed to targeting the myeloid population. And so the, there's this question, what does it mean to activate the myeloid cells? Um, we can inhibit something called the M1, M2 polarization, and I'll talk about that in a second. You can facilitate antigen presentation or you can have them come into the tumor. Right? Those are the three big buckets that, that I think about in trying to do this. So what we think is going on is when these macrophages are immunosuppressive, they call them M2. When they are pro-inflammatory to kill cancer, they become M1. So there are a lot of different agents that are being tested today that are trying to target this. There's these um, pathway inhibitors like IDO, DAMPs, and PAMPs. Um, oncolytic viruses, TLR agonists. So what happens is when you give one of these agents, we think we reverse it to an M1 phenotype, right? For example, CSF1 or IDO. And then what happens is after you give these agents, you hopefully get, make these things start presenting antigens, right? To present to the T cells. And then what we think happens is it goes from the tumor into the draining lymph nodes to then teach the T cells to ultimately go and kill the cancer cells. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different um, pathways to turn it on. And this is an active area investigation. And we don't know what the hierarchy for this is and which cells are relevant for GBM. So many of us are testing different approaches. An example of some, uh, uh, we think, impressive results. This is a tokogen study. And they were injecting viruses into patients. And when you uh, injected these viruses, some of these patients were getting um, very impressive responses, complete responses against glioblastoma. And many of us believe it's because it's activating the myeloid compartment. And what viruses do is they activate something called toll-like receptors, they're called TLRs, to then activate uh, the myeloid cells to start killing cancer. And so uh, Tomas Garzanmuthi, who is one of my postdocs, who's now on faculty at Southwestern, 
showed that sometimes if you give this in combination with PD-1, you could get improved survival. And so we, as I mentioned before, we've tested different agents. Um, this is a study that was published by Derek Wainwright showing that a, a pathway called IDO, um, he's upregulated in GBM and might be a great target. And when he gave that with PD-1 and CTLA-4, they got this really nice synergistic response. So one of the studies that we're doing, and I apologize, this is an outdated slide, but we're trying to do a, a biomarker-driven trial for our patients and it's open here at Hopkins. So what happens is patients get surgery, um, we take out the tissue, and then we're actually staining them, for example, IDO. If they're positive for IDO, they get put on IDO plus PD-1. If they're negative, they get put on CTLA-4, but we're trying to do more personalized approaches for our patients. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about one last part uh, for um, some final thoughts for glioblastomas. So GBMs are what we think in a hospitable environment, right? So it turns out that um, cancers also probably have some physical attributes to them to make them not responsive to immunotherapy, okay? One of them that we learned, one aspect that we learned was from uh, pancreatic cancers. Pancreatic cancers are extremely fibrous tumors. They're so fibrous that they say that T cells physically cannot get in, okay? And so this group uh, from uh, WashU thought that perhaps if you can soften up the tumors, the T cells can come in and become responsive. So they inhibited this uh, enzyme called FAC, all right? And when they started inhibiting this enzyme called FAC, they were able to actually um, get improved survival in mice uh, with anti-PD-1, right? So physically disrupting the tumor microenvironment and physically uh, disrupting the stroma uh, can potentially improve uh, immunotherapy responses, which is probably something what, that focused ultrasound would be very good at doing, right? Softening up the tumor. Another thing that I thought was very interesting was ionic immunosuppression. This is a very fancy word for saying they, Nick Restifo's group basically tested some, an idea of necrosis. So it turns out that T cells, which are good fighters, right? Um, if they go into a tumor that's hypoxic or necrotic, full of toxins, they probably won't fight as well, okay? And so what they hypothesized was that if you have a lot of necrosis, you're gonna have high intracellular levels of potassium. That's what they use as their markers. And so what they did was they showed that if you take T cells and soak them in media that has high levels of potassium, those T cells don't work so well. But if you put channels or pumps that pump out the potassium from these T cells, you could reverse it. But the whole point of this was that they said, again, necrosis plays an important role in, again, the T cells working. They have to become more oxygenated. Um, they need some oxygen to be able to work, right? Again, another opportunity for figuring out ways to disrupt the tumor. Maybe if you can cause more tumor, um, you know, opening up the vasculature, maybe getting more oxygenation in, that could again be another way to get or enhance an immune response, right? It also turns out that glycolysis is also very important. It turns out that if there's not a lot of good, if the um, cells are in, in um, doing a lot of lactate metabolism, the T cells aren't gonna work as well. These T cells are like fast moving cells and they need gl glucose to be able to work. They don't work so well with gly uh, lactose. And then the last thing is, um, I think this whole concept of environmental is very fascinating. Have you guys heard about the gut brain axis? So, you know, it's interesting. There was a study that was published where these researchers were looking at um, colon cancer and they were treating with immunotherapy. And essentially what they found was that when they, they bought mice from one vendor to Conic, they had a different survival rate compared to mice bought from Jackson Labs. And so they, they thought it was actually the gut uh, microbiome. So basically when they reversed the feed, they got they were able to reverse the survival curve. So it turns out the bacteria content of what's in the gut probably also dictates how your immune system works, right? And that all gets back to how our lifestyle, I mean, the way we live and the, and the food we eat could probably profoundly affect the, the immune system, okay? It's also very interesting. They had a study recently, this is a little bit off topic, where they st studied women in Europe who took antibiotics during pregnancy. And if they took antibiotics that you know, wiped out the gut flora, there's a higher rate of autism in kids. 
So um, it, there's something about the gut that profoundly affects the brain, okay? It's also very interesting because this is all lifestyle based. Um, there was a nice paper that was published by, um, or an abstract that was published by Derek Wainwright. And they looked at uh, mice that were obese and mice that were, uh, I mean young and mice that were old. And it turned out that if you're older, your immune system doesn't work as well. There was another study that was published in Nature Medicine, uh, I can't remember the name of the group, but they looked at obese versus skinny mice. And again, the obese mice did worse. But if you had super skinny mice, they didn't do so well either. Like uh, anecdotally, we always say patients who are marathon runners don't do well uh, with cancer because they really don't, they almost have this like cachexia-like state. So, um, and another group of people took mice and stressed them out. They put them in these little plastic bags that they could breathe, but it turns out that if you're super stressed out, you're not gonna live as well. So there's all these different components. The immunotherapy has opened up a whole new, um, area where we could potentially um, uh, modify patients' uh, behavior, you know, in, in terms of environment to perhaps improve uh, efficacy of immunotherapy. But, you know, I put this last slide in to say that just because we, for example, use lag three, we're not naive enough to think that they're not going to develop resistance to it. And so um, we always are, I think, as we develop these therapies, thinking about the next steps and potential resistance mechanisms. So, you know, right now, I think in conclusion, immunotherapy results have been disappointing, but there are, have been responders, okay? It's just probably because GBMs high, have high adaptive intrinsic uh, resistance, we need to be more thoughtful in the way we de design our therapies. There are a lot of different combination approaches that are out there. Um, as we come for this you know, session, obviously, with um, something like focused uh, ultrasound, um, this could potentially be, uh, I think, a potential avenue to try to augment immunotherapy strategies. Um, interestingly enough, when we started giving radiation to myeloid cells, we also changed the way they polarize. And I suspect that um, with focused energy, like focused ultrasound, these myeloid cells will also be altered. The GBM microenvironment is also hostile to immune cells, a lot of necrosis and a lot of hypoxia. And so those are things that we need to address. And then we probably will need to address uh, resistance to immunotherapy. So with that, I wanna make sure I acknowledge that it's a lot of work over the years from a lot of really bright people that I've worked with, as well as collaborations with different labs at Hopkins and outside of Hopkins. Um, we also have a great clinical trials division and, and we work with some fantastic clinicians um, in radiation oncology, medical oncology, and neuropath and neuroradiology too, which I, I didn't put in here, as well as my colleagues in neurosurgery. Um, this is really our brain tumor immunotherapy program. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a really uh, great journey. We, when I started, it started with one technician and now this is our group. And so really proud to uh, be able to work with them. And then, um, you know, this is my relevant funding for, for this. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Lim, for that very interesting talk. We've had several questions submitted uh, by the audience. So the first one is, do you think immunotherapy like checkpoint inhibitors may be more effective for GBM if tumor burden is initially reduced via cytoreduction? So, um, you know, I think that's the thought, but we have to be careful with these types of, um, with cytoreduction, it could potentially help, right? As I mentioned before, these immunotherapies take six months sometimes to work. And so with cytoreduction, it may be buying you time. Um, but some of these ablative therapies, again, as I said, I like to think of them as kindling. If, for example, when we give stereotactic radiosurgery, you know, I'm not trying to be, uh, trying not to make that a definitive therapy for our patients. Uh, I wanna make it something to start an immune response. So, you know, cytoreduction could help, but uh, again, we should try to do this to try to disrupt the tumor as much as possible. And I'd be more interested in, in trying to be disruptive more than uh, definitive with these modalities such as surgery or radiation. The next question is, what does the role of BBB disruption play in immunotherapy of gliomas or brain mets? Will it be beneficial to disrupt BBB to enhance effectiveness of immunotherapy in the brain? So um, I think that's a great question. So I think it's based, it's immunotherapy dependent, strategy dependent, okay? We had um, a set of experiments where we gave anti-PD-1 
to mice in the brain directly through direct delivery. Um, and we actually found no benefit. But when we delivered the anti-PD-1 systemically, for example, and at the lymph nodes, we, we did get benefit. So it suggests that the PD-1 antibody doesn't really need to get to the brain to kill the brain cancer, right? In mice, at least. Whereas with something like Stingvax, which we just recently published in Oncotarget, the Stingvax being in the brain does better. So some of these immunotherapy agents definitely would do better probably with disruption of the blood-brain barrier. The next question, can you elaborate more about the ability to tailor the variety of treatments to the patient's unique GBM? Do you also foresee a more significant role of liquid biopsies to monitor disease progression and direct combined therapies? Sure. So, you know what, I think glioblastomas, uh, so as I mentioned before, we're, we're just scratching the surface with this. So we're doing a, a, a study where we're trying to be um, more tailored by looking at immunohistochemistry for a, a small set of proteins. But um, absolutely, I think that will be critical in, in um, designing GBM therapies. Because I think many of us in this room would agree that GBMs are truly a heterogeneous disease. And um, you know, patient A and patient B may have a very different disease process and very different immunosuppression. So I think that personalized medicine uh, with immunotherapy and all the other modalities is gonna be critical. Um, you know, there's, there's been some interesting studies showing that within a GBM tumor itself, different regions can have very different um, phenotypes. Um, one could be mesenchymal and one could be proneural, for example, with these different subtypes. So um, I think as we get these new you know, technologies such as single cell sequencing um, will give us a much more granularity in trying to uh, attack this tumor. But I think precision medicine is the way to do it. So last question. Um, when you're thinking about combining multiple different treatment options and trying to figure out dosage and timing, how do you begin to narrow the parameter space to actually design a clinical trial? So that's, you know, that's a great question. And un unfortunately, it's a hard answer to, to give. You know, in mice, for example, you just create more arms. But with, with patients and humans, I mean, with humans, we can't do that, right? And so, um, you know, I think preclinical data plays an important role in trying to help us um, figure out dosing and timing. For example, uh, when I had a, the stereotactic radiosurgery trial um, we combined with immunotherapy, it became clear to us logistically that it was gonna be difficult to give the patients drug and radiosurgery the same day, right? So we went back to the lab and we gave the animals the, um, the immunotherapy drugs one half-life before, same day, and one half-life after, and we compared the survival. And we didn't see any difference. And so because of that, we actually built a one-week window before and after uh, for patients to be able to get their immunotherapy drugs before the radiation. So, um, you know, I think that's where sometimes the, you know, the preclinical models can be very helpful. Now, we realize the preclinical models aren't perfect, and there's probably some, uh, it may, we may be completely wrong, but at least there's some rational basis for that. And I think that's an important part of the preclinical studies. Thank you again for that fantastic talk. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us today and stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations for future webinars.